Okay. This is our last uh, lecture, the semester. So almost there. Last uh, class, last topic. Uh, first of all, uh, the second course evaluation, same as the first one. So if 90% of you give uh, reviews and everyone get uh, eight bonus points. Since right now I have 44 students, actually 45, but uh, when I labor some homework, so I assume it's not. Uh, it's talking anyway, so uh, so it doesn't count. So which means we need a four year reviews. Okay, so uh, last class we talked about micro architecture or layer security uh, for modern CPUs. We talked about uh, hash side channel attack. We see several examples of uh, different hash side channel attack approaches. We Talk about the mailbox and spectrum. I don't know if you have finished the homework yet. Uh, the homework still is Thursday, so we still have some. Um, if you haven't done that, uh, we still have some reading to do. So today we are going to talk about the last topic of this semester: uh, heap and uh, heap security. So this is a this is a big topic. Uh, there has been a lot of research in this topic in the last uh, 15 years. Um, and this is a really serious, serious problem, um, especially for modern browsers. A lot of attacks we have right now, uh, the attackers get in your computer through browser. You just visit a website. Uh, that website has some JavaScript, and that JavaScript can trigger low level vulnerabilities like a uh, uh, heat based buffer or both, and eventually uh, from use your browser or the screen board and eventually take full control of your computer. So that is a very real attack. Um, so today we're, we will use several examples to take a look how does a uh, heap buffer overflow works and uh, also something beyond the heap buffer workflow. So this is a, a picture I show you in the very first of class this semester. So for a process, um, we are already familiar with other sections like uh, the code section, the data segment, the uninitialized uh, variables. Also, we have been working on stack for a while. Remember the stack? Goes down. Uh, however, there's another area for the heap. Uh, the heap, the heap goes up. So, same as the stack, the heap is not really managed by the kernel. It's still managed by the uh, your product, uh, of course, by user land product. So it's actually managed by the library. So the two basic operations of a heap. Uh, by the way, in your data structure class, there is also a concept of a heap. Uh, that's a totally different thing. That heap is basically a binary tree. Um, here, heap is uh, just a pool of memory used for dynamic allocation of memory at a runtime. So this is different from stack because that stack, you see all the variables on stack they are variable because there are instructions to push to increase or decrease the ESP. So basically, the, those are determined at a compiler time, uh, not runtime. But the heap is used at runtime. And the, the C standard library has several heap function interfaces. So they have the same name, for example, malloc free. So there are different implementations of those say libraries, but the function name, the function prototypes, they're the same. Um, the first one is malloc. Malloc basically uh, give you some memory on the heap, uh, free releases memory on the heap, um, but both of them, there are user and uh, library interfaces, library functions. 
So they do not directly map to any system core. So they are not like a system for like open, close, send the file. So at a system level, system core level, there are several system calls related to them, uh, like the map, which is memory map. Another one is a brick, ERK, but we're not going to talk about them. We are only talking about the user and the so this is a prototype of Maloc and also free. So Maloc, uh, you start the name, you can see it's probably stands for uh, memory alloc allocation. And this is the only parameter it takes is uh, size. And uh, the, the, the type of size is size T. That is also important here because size T it is different, uh, has different bytes depending on which platform you are using. You can see there 64 bit platform size T is uh, 8 bytes, 34, 32 bit is just a 4 bytes. So, malloc, this function, this interface basically allocates uh, some bytes, uninitialize the storage uh, to you to use. And uh, it returns a pointer. Uh, if it is successful, the pointer points to the memory area you can directly use. If it's not successful, it returns zero. Uh, correspondingly, there is another. Correspondingly, there is another function called a free, uh, which deallocates the memory space previously allocated by malloc and because of that it takes an address as a parameter the address basically is just a void star it doesn't really matter um it's a e to star or whatever so here we can see the void star uh, there are several more functions like uh caloc c-a-l-l-o-c uh, also, there's another one for a realloc, but they are quite similar. So we're we'll focused on those two interfaces. So how to use those interfaces? We just use this simple example to show that. We have a simple main function of a local variable buffer, which points to zero. Then we want to allocate um, 256 bytes of memory on the heap. So, then we dynamically at one time we call the function malloc and give the size here. Of course, the size can be changed, right? Because that's a parameter. That parameter can from at one time can take one from user. So, that can be changed. So, this will give you 256 bytes. Um, on the heap, not on the stack. Uh, then we read some input by STD in, then we just print it out. So after you use this, you are supposed to call free to release that memory. Uh, this, a lot of people free to, uh, forgot to do this, and that is a, a programming arc. Uh, uh, also, a lot of people. Uh, after free, they still use that pointer that is also a bug. So this is uh, how you just use malloc and uh, free. So I, how many of you used this before? You know, program assignment. Okay, good. Most of you use it. So if we compare heap and the uh, stack, um, first stack is the variables on stack. They are allocated at compiler time. They are used for local variables, uh, return addresses, and also the arguments. Uh, it's very fast because allocate, because it's compiler time. Getting a variable there is just a, remember those instructions, subtract some value from ESP. So that's kind of like one instruction. So very fast. Uh, technically, there's not much runtime overhead. However, if here we are calling this function malloc to get 
the memory, right? So it's very complicated. This model could be solid lines of code, which usually you do not look um, to look in the in, inside of that, but usually it's a um, solid lines of code to implement it. Uh, however, uh, SAC, usually you cannot use it for very large buffers. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, because stack is used for one function, what if you call that function multiple times, then you are going to create multiple huge um, buffers. And sometimes you don't really need that huge buffers. So if you need a huge buffers and you only need one instance of that, then you should go for heap. And um, also, uh, to use heap, you have to explicitly call those functions. So for C level, it's not out. Out for C plus plus, you are using the a new and delete. So they are basically the same thing. So new and delete are keywords in C plus plus. But like I said, that this is not a really a kernel thing. This is just your Ethernet. Um, because of that, there have been many different implementations. Uh, of um, this um, malloc free suite. Um, the very popular one is called the DL malloc. So this has been the default library um, in some old Linux distributions. And uh, the one right now is quite popular is this one called PT malloc. And this one is actually based on the first one, DL malloc. Um, it's just to add if uh, the support for multiple threads. Uh, then Google has its own mock for the PC mock that's probably used in Android, I guess. Uh, also, uh, I like this one, it's called the Hold Memory Allocator. So, this is this is developed by a professor at uh, UMass Amherst. Amherst. So uh, he, he's a very good system guy, made a lot of contributions to, to system and system security. So he developed, also developed an allocator. Uh, there is another one, quite famous, probably one of the oldest one, which is called a, a big band of uh, pages. Uh, it's called EIB, EIB BOP, maybe. BBOP, that's another quite famous one. That one was developed in the 1970s. Um, so if you want to check what monoc you are using, um, the default one I'm using, if I just do a LTD version, you can say you can say the C library version I'm using is a uh, uh, let's say 2.31. And if I just search this one, just Google it. I just Google uh, keep implementation. Let me just model. Then you can find the source code of this. So, Okay. Yeah, so that's the systems programming card? Yeah. Okay, I see. Okay, so you can see the malloc I'm using is like uh, the default one on my computer. It's basically this one. It has a uh, very nice code. 5,000 lines of code. Uh, even though it's Ethernet, but it's quite complicated. Um, if you if you check the header, you can actually say the one I'm using is called the uh, PTMalloc version two. Okay. 
So, like I said, since this is a user and saying, um, like what you do in your class, you can develop your own malloc, then just use uh, a load preload trick to replace the uh, default one. Okay. So, since some of you have been using malloc and also develop malloc, then let's um, let's play a little game here. So I have four different um, invocations of monarch here. So can you guess how many bytes on heap uh, are your monarch chunks really taking up in this case? For example, the first one, my application wants to get 32 bytes. So I monarch 32. Also the last one, I just do monarch zero, okay? So can you guess under the hood how many bytes the manager or helper uh, has to use for this? This is different from heap, but different from stack. Yeah, I'm talking about the the PT malloc. Exactly. Yeah. So here you need to you need to think about to manage 32 bytes of data. You need some mail data there, uh, which on the heap you don't need that. So if we are going to use this program, I took this program from somewhere else website anyway. So we're going to use this program to check how many bytes we are using. So this program. At the very beginning, we have uh, an array of uh, 10 integers. So they present the different sizes we want to request from the allocator. Then we have an uh, array of pointers, also 10 items. So that's where we're going to store pointers we receive. Then we're going to request 10 uh, heap, let's call it heap chunks or memory um, malloc chunks. We're going to get 10 of those, and the size are defined there. So after that, we're just print out the address of uh, the address of those pointers we get. Okay. So by by doing that, we can calculate how many bytes are actually allocated for us, including the meta, including the metadata. Let's say okay, this is a program, so we're going to run the 32 bit version first. So this is a 32-bit version. So first of all, size t is four bytes. A pointer is also four bytes because of every address is just four bytes. And we can say we call 10 times malloc. And the first time we request 32 bytes, but under the hood actually 48 bytes uh, were used and uh, we are going to use 32 bytes, but there are 16 bytes of uh, padding and also metadata. Uh, something interesting is if you just do malloc zero, it will also cost 16 bytes. Okay, some padding. I think it's four, eight bytes of padding and eight bytes of uh, metadata in this case. Um, so you can see if you ask for four bytes or zero bytes. Um, they will cost the 16 bytes. So padding is like eight, eight bytes. So if you ask for 64, what you get is um, seven, uh, same, 16 bytes more. So if we run the 64 bit version, the result is uh, similar. 
a difference for zero and four, there's 32 bytes, there's 16 bytes, because first of all, the mana data size is different, and also the panning could also be different. So let me remind you again, the heap goes up, which means go back to um, this one, we allocate 10 different and like 10 different uh, buffers or chunks here. And um, is, it is guaranteed that the, this is a memory, this is a heap, not a stack. Uh, this is a low address, this is higher address. So the first chunk will always go to lower address. The second one goes higher, um, then keep going up. So this is different from stack. In stack, the first it goes down. So the first function will have the highest address. Then uh, other functions called by the first function will keep going down. So this way it's different. Uh, also, if you look at the look at the address here, they are they are adjacent to each other. Yeah. So I know this one is B zero. So sixteen bytes. So the next one is E zero. Uh, this one is A zero. So the E C D. So they are adjacent to each other. Now uh, just some pen. So in summary, uh, on my computer, uh, this is the actual bytes, the annotator were spent on managing the chunks on, on heap. So if you really want to understand why is this, then you can look at the source code. Uh, this is the source code for the version I'm, I'm using. So each monoc chunk, it has a data structure look like this. Uh, the first two are type uh, size T. Uh, the internal size T is the same as size T, which means 64 bit is eight bytes, uh, 32 bit is four bytes. So the first number is called Number of the structure is called a previous chunk size. So this one, so internally, the allocator will maintain a double links to link all the three chunks together. Um, I'm not sure about the version I'm using because I didn't check uh, all the source code, but uh, depending on my test. Um, it looks like um, the version I'm using is not really using a double, uh, double link there. Uh, anyway, so there is uh, the first uh, number is called the previous, the previous chunk. Basically, the previous one, um, the size of that one. Uh, but this one is zero if the previous one is in use. Only if the previous one is free, it will have some value. Then it has the size of its own chunk. Uh, and this one, this size includes everything, not only um, the buffer size, but also the metadata size. Then there is, are two pointers. So those are only used when this chunk is free. If this chunk is in use, then after those two, that's the band. That's the buffer. The, and okay, it returns to you. Only if it's free, this has two fields to, to link all the three chunks together. Uh, after that, we have a, a big uh, large box. So, um, so we don't need to worry about that. So this is uh, basically the code I take from the examples. So let's take a closer look at this panel structure. So when you make a function called malloc 256 bytes, uh, what really happens under the hood um, for PT or PT malloc is it will return you eventually 
return you some address for you to use. And uh, let's go to address buffer. Okay. So you actually first create a chunk look like this. Um, it first has four bytes of that previous chunk size, the one we just looked at, the first number. The second, there is another four bytes of chunk size of its own deep chunk. Then it has a gap. Um, of course, there are some padding here to make sure the file is uh, aligned. So this is obviously 32 bit. So that's why it says four bytes, four bytes here, but as you can see in the source code, uh, the actual size is size D. So for 64 bit, it's actually uh, eight bytes, not 64, no, not four bytes. So Mark actually returns you the address from here. This is a buffer you get from Mark. And before that, there are two items uh, of the main item. So we can use this source code. This is a code to, um, to understand the structure. We are going to unlock a lot of chunks and the size increases. And some of them you can say quite big, 16K bytes. Usually you not request something like that on the, on the stack. So we're just going to unlock those. Uh, after that, we are just going to print uh, everything of the chunk. So remember, malloc returns you the address of that buffer. Okay, so we put that address of buffer into that print chunk function. Then in that print chunk function, we first print out the previous, the previous, the previous chunk size. That's what we're going to do here. Um, and the first, so this part is obviously the format string. Then this is actually what we're going to print out. Um, I changed the code a little bit because we have a, because the box there doesn't work for 64 version, so I changed it a little bit. So, so this is a pointer. This is the point of the buffer. If we treat that pointer as a size T buffer, then the matters the matters two. So what will we get? So this is the buffer we get here. This is the pointer we get here. We treat this as a size size T. So we minus one we get here, we minus two we get here, right? Then we do reference this value. Okay. This I change that point to size T, so it works for. Both 32 and the 64 version. So this is what we're doing here. So this one basically gives us the previous chunk size. Then this one gives us the current chunk size. The third one gives us um, the address of uh, the buffer. <laughs> then the lens is what we give, what basically what we input it. So if we run this program, we run this program, and this is what we get. Now all of those buffers, there is no free buffer in this case. We created the buffers, we didn't free them, and uh, those are the buffer address which uh, allocator gave us b5 b0 5 c0 and this one is for the malloc zero and you can see the size of itself in this case is 11 it's actually it's actually 10 10 is 16. Uh, the last one is for some flags so the last 
So and you can say everyone here has a one. Oh, that one is out, out of the socks. That is a flag. So it doesn't have a, the, its previous. This is the first chunk. So it doesn't really have a previous chunk. So it has zero. And then for this one, it has a previous chunk. However, that one is not free. So this one is also zero. So everyone here is zero. So this is what we have for three two bit. 64 bit, the same. Well, I didn't print all the, on this part correctly. I didn't print all the full address. It doesn't really matter. Mm, you can see the difference here is the size. Um, even you do not really get any buffer, it takes um, 20, which is 32, 32 bytes here. So that's what we say for 32 bytes. Okay, so you already say this. Um, there are two different states for uh, each big chunk. It is either in use or it is uh, free. If it is in use, this is a data structure. Two numbers of uh, metadata and just the data you can, the error you can use. Uh, if it's free, then the data structure looks like this. The same metadata here, then there is uh, two more fields of metadata. One is a forward, basically a forward pointer, forward pointer, another one is a backward pointer. So if you have this, you can link all the chunks together, the free chunks together to have a double link. Uh, however, the version I'm using based on my testing didn't really implement a full double double link here. Okay, so we can use this program to test that. The same thing here, we create five chunks, each is 32 bytes. We lock it here. And after that, we print it out. This is the same print function, almost the same print function we used before. And after that, we're going to free all of those. So now, though all those five chunks are free, they change the state. Then we print out its value again. So when we free it, the difference is uh, when we free it, we will check the forward pointer and also backward pointer here. So if we run this program on my computer, so this is the 32 bit version. So this is an unlocking, the unlocking five uh, chunks. Each of them is actually because it's three zeros, so it's 48 bytes. And you can see that they are adjacent to each other. Then we free all of those. After we free that, if this is a double link, um we should we should see some values here, right? You know, the previous one, there's a double link, it's a loop. But the previous one should always have some value. However, on my computer, it's not really the case. We can say this one has address A5, A, uh, A8. A8, well, it's, it's basically the same as E0. They're, they're referring to the same block, chunk. That's an eight bytes of uh, difference there. So, so that's why this one, the second one, is forward pointer going to the first one. Okay. And you can see this one E0. E, no, this one is zero six zero eight. So this one is a forward pointer going to the second one. Okay. And this one points to this one. 
So basically, this is a every every item here its forward pointer points to the previous one. However, its backward pointer they all point to the same place, and that and this place is not a place um, we mark. So that is basically the head of the link. So all of them is like that. So this doesn't. I don't know if if this is because I'm only marking five here. So the annotator shows a more efficient way to implement this. So it doesn't really create a full of a double link. But you can say this is definitely a single link here. So everyone links back to a header. That's why everyone, the previous one, the anchor link, uh, it's not really a free a chunk there. So this is um, on my computer. But if you use a um, different system, the results may be different. So technically, it should be a double link. According to some documents, it should be a double link. Okay, so that's the uh, background knowledge you need for heap. Uh, obviously, we're using ptmalloc example, but you can say there are many different implementations. Some of the implementations they have a security in mind. Uh, actually, for the conference, um, I am uh, a PC member. In this week, I just reviewed two papers talking about how to secure key based on workflow. So they design their own uh, malloc implementation. The next, let's say, how can we do buffer workflow uh, on heap? So the basic idea of heap based buffer workflow uh, is the same as a stack based uh, buffer workflow. However, um, Defense wise, we cannot use uh, cookies or canaries um, because in stack based overflow, we have a cookie there. The, if the cookie is overwritten later, we have a return instruction. Um, eventually, the function have, have to return. So that's a point we can check if the cookie um, is here intact. However, for heap, you don't really know when an object will be used later. You do not know when you should check if uh, the heat data is changed by somewhere else. And um, this is a very real attack uh, because um, on the heap, we have all kinds of uh, complex structures, uh, especially for programs like browser. Browser use the heap a lot because browser executes code downloaded from the web, like JavaScript. That's code downloaded from the web. And those code can do all kinds of things. And you can request a lot of a, a big chunk of memory and the other the boot, even though it's JavaScript, but other the boot, the browser will use heap to retrieve those memories for JavaScript to use. So since there are very complicated structures, um, some of those structures will have very dangerous code pointers. The return address on stack is a code pointer, a function pointer we say before in zip does, that's also a um, code pointer. Uh, those very complex structures, they usually have code pointers. Uh, especially for C++, every C++ object at the beginning, there is a virtual table, virtual function table, and those are all function pointers. So if you can overwrite that, then you can um, basically subvert the control flow. You can make the EIP to have some uh, uh, malicious values you want. So we are going to use this example to say heat based on uh, buffer overflow. This is just a C program with some uh, structure. Uh, 
Um, so this is basically a program I wrote before. Uh, we have uh, let, let's look at the side. Uh, we have uh, the print secret uh, secret function. Uh, we have a uh, fly function. They have the same prototype. The fly function basically print out flying. The secret function print out the secret. Blah, blah, blah. Our goal is obviously to call the secret function. Same as what we did in stack based uh, our program. Then we have a structure for airplane. The airplane structure has two members. The first one is a function pointer. Uh, remember 34 bit, 32 bits? This is basically four bytes. Then it has a buffer called the name, uh, which you can include the name of the airplane. So that's basically the uh, airplane structure. Uh, this looks like a very simple structure, but this is a basic skeleton of uh, complicated C++ structures and also other um, C structures you can imagine. At the beginning, you have a function pointer. In C++, there could be multiple function pointers. Then you have some um, number variables. And then the problem here is there is a buffer overflow on the second one, the main. Okay, look at the main function to make the hack easier and print out the address of the fly, also the address of secret function here. Then we first malloc an airplane on the heap. We call it the pointer is called P1. Then we print out its address. Then we malloc a second airplane uh, and print out the address. So so those two, then we have two allocated uh, airplane on the heap, but they are not initialized. That's why for both of them, we change its function pointer to point to the fly function, okay? After that, we, are, we have that uh, user input here to get the name of the airplane. And this is where the vulnerabilities. First, we get the name of the second airplane, and uh, we are only taking 10 characters, 10 bytes from STD, and the buffer here is 20 bytes. So there is no buffer overflow. However, the second one, we are getting the name of uh, the first airplane, and uh, we are getting, uh, could be, as many as 50 bytes. And uh, the buffer is 20 bytes. That's why buffer overflow is possible. So after that, we just call those two functions. Okay. So if there is no overflow, those two function calls will be the same as the fly. Both of them will just be fly. Uh, after that, we just uh, free this one. So if we run this program, <laughs> Run this program, print out the address of fly and secret, then airplane one and airplane one's name's address. You can say airplane one is at E0. Then the name is the second number, right? The first number is the function pointer. It, it has four, four bytes. That's why this address is basically the airplane's address also the function pointer's address. Then four bytes higher than that, we have the main's address, okay? Four bytes. Then airplane two is a different address. So then we can, right now it's asking us for the name of the airplane. Let's try Airbus going here. Okay, so those are two short names. So there is no overflow. So if we just the, uh, Keep executing, we just get a fly. Okay. However, there could be a buffer overflow if we include a lot of uh, the first one doesn't matter because the first one, the 
the first one is here, it's only getting 10 bytes anyway. So no matter how much you input, it's only getting 10 bytes. Um, however, because of 10 bytes, others were somewhere when you were triggered the overflow. Uh, we can do it in the other way. This, this, then we do this. Then we're going to overwrite the function pointer. That's why we get this segment of fault. So if we want to check exactly what that segment for covers, um, we can do all the memory map like this. Remember, this is not stack anymore, this is heat. Um, we created the first airplane first, so right? This is the first airplane. So it was at a lower address. So the green one, the green part is the first airplane. It's at a lower address. And uh, we know that it has four bytes. This is 32 bit version. So we know we have the four bytes of the previous chunk size, another four bytes of its own size, and the, the data part. The data part, first we have that function pointer, which is four bytes. Then we have the main 20 bytes, and all of them together is exactly 32 bytes. That's why we don't have any padding in this case. Okay, exactly 20, 32 bytes. Then on the heap, we create the second airplane, which is this part. So then we have two FCATs. The first one set the name here. Okay. Even if there's an upper overflow, you were just the overflow to the higher address. You were not have a chance to overflow airplane one, right? However, the second one, there is we are going to overflow this part. So because of that, we can overflow 50 bytes from here. So then after that, if we're going to call this function, that's why when we overflow some garbage here, it gives us some uh, address which doesn't really have uh, uh, executable instructions and we get a second fault. That's the reason. So, so you can see if we want to, Use this vulnerability, exploit this vulnerability to call a secret. Um, it, it's very straightforward from this point. We just get the address of secret, then put it here, right? Then we will be. So, of course, when we do that, we're going to override this one and this one. But uh, we have this function. Um, it doesn't really matter. Even if we override those, it doesn't really matter. So what we're going to do is we're going to overwrite 20 bytes, four bytes, four bytes, which is 28 bytes. Then four bytes of address. Then we will be over. We can override this one. So later when we do T2 uh, calling the T function, it will be print out the secret. So after that, so when we do that, there was no error. After that, the program keeps running, and eventually, it's going to free this one. Okay, but since we have been overwriting the metadata, those two metadata, when we when the annotator frees that, the metadata um, is changed, and the annotator may not able to free that one. So after that, it could have a second fault. Um, but it will be after we getting the secret, calling the function, no, we won't. So let's see. So what we want to do is um, the same trick we used before, we just do a Python print. Awesome. Okay, so 
how many bytes we want. Oh, so first of all, there are two inputs, right? So the first one, we just do this. That's for the first input. We're not going to overwrite anything. The second one, we're going to have uh, Twenty-eight, twenty-eight bytes. Then after that, we have that secret address, which is four D six two five 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 six. Right? Okay. So we'll type this into uh, version. Select the secret the second time. When we're pulling that function, we're not pulling five anymore. We're pulling the secret to the second. Then after that, um, the annotator actually finds out the metadata doesn't make sense. So it prints out that there is either a double three or a corruption error, then it ends the program. Okay. But we get what we want. So um, this is, is the idea of a buffer workflow on that, um, on, on B. And you can see all the techniques we learned so far, um, they can be combined together, chained together to, um, to hack real world improvements. Uh, in fact, right now, uh, there are a lot of uh, hacking competitions or uh, even um, bug bounty programs, and uh, uh, most of those are exploit, real world exploit, uh, they were combined several techniques together to make it work because there are so many different uh, layers right now, and uh, no single vulnerability can, can exploit all those, can bypass all those defenses. Um, another very common vulnerability related to uh, this is something called use after free or UAF. Uh, if you read the system papers, uh, you can still see a lot of papers on this topic. So this is a class of vulnerability where uh, data on the heap is free. Uh, however, there is another pointer somewhere pointing to that demo on the heap. That pointer is not um, reinitialized, it's not changed to zero. So that pointer at some point later um, could be dereferenced. However, it is not dereferencing the demo uh, in sort, it is. The um, dereferencing anymore because the original data has been free. Uh, and this is, is a very common bug in uh, browsers or other complicated programs use a lot of heat. So, this is uh, some figures to show the basic idea of this vulnerability. So, this is a runtime address space of our program, and this is basically the heat. Assume we have one three heap chunks here uh, following that NR structure we are already familiar with. Then on stack, there could be a pointer. That pointer, so it's a data pointer, the pointer points to a piece of heap chunk we just allocated. Okay, imagine this is like an airplane. We allocate an airplane uh, object on the or structure on the heap. Then later, that data structure is free. So there is no airplane on the heap anymore. However, this pointer is not updated. This pointer is not changed to zero. So this would be just a bad practice of programming. Whenever you free this, this side, you have an echo, you should change to zero. But um, 
Um, this is also a burden for uh, software developers, programmers. So we always make mistakes. So the pointer is zero point zero, nothing changed. The layer, a ladder, a ladder object is created here. Totally different object, a car object is created. And this pointer still trying to access the numbers here or trying to um, call a function to it, then it will be error, right? So this pointer in literature, um, they have a name for it, a uh, daggering pointer or a uh, stale pointer, the papers, those are the terms uh, you will see in papers. So basically it's just a leftover pointer in the code that references free data. Because that, that error could be already be free. Um, there is no guarantee the data is what you want. Um, for example, here we can unlock a new chunk, totally different data, and the pointer is also free. So let's see one uh, example how to uh, exploit this. Exploiting this is it's a very simple in principle. If you have a principle of this, this is, this is very, very simple. It is almost the same program. Uh, secret, fine, but no? I didn't put the full code here. So I can switch the code. Okay, this is a uh, source code. So we have two different objects here uh, struct or uh, object and struct are uh, the same thing in C. That's why I say object. So the first one is airplane. The airplane, the first number is a uh, function pointer, then we have a uh, name for it, 20 bytes. And we also have a car structure. The car structure, the first number is volume. So this is an integer. This is a, uh, a code pointer, but they have the same size, four bytes. So it could be. Then they have the name. So those two structures can say the same size. Then the program, the vulnerable program works like this. It first to create the airplane structure. It try to initialize everything like the uh, pointer function. Uh, it also calls the fly function. Then it frees it, right? That's the key. It, fr it frees it. After that, the chunk is freed. That free chunk will be reused later. Uh, at least the PT malloc I'm using. If you do another malloc with the same size, it's guaranteed. So the error you just afraid will be used for uh, the new object. They're the same size anyway. Okay. So the P here, this is a local variable on the stack. So this one becomes that stable pointer. This one originally it points to an airplane object on the heap. After free. This, this is also interesting thing is that the free function, the free function will not reset the P, okay? Uh, all of our new C programmers get confused here. They saw the free function will reset P to zero. It will not. So after free, the object on a heap is free. However, the P stays the same. So when we allocate, uh, a car again, the P will get the same value. It was it had the same value before. But anyway, now if we let's say now we are going to get the value of the car from user input, but this time we are getting an integer, unsigned integer. That's why I'm using percentage U here. That's for unsigned integer. We're we'll using percentage D. That's for signed integer. Also in some mastering library, we're using 
person just here is going to be you on site. So we'll get it on volume, and the volume is a local variable here. So we're going to send that local variable to that numbers, to that cars uh, volume. Okay. So this, those two lines can be combined into one. Okay. Anyway. So after that, let's say the programmer forgot that this is a car. The programmer told this is still an airplane. The still try to call that function. Everything has a function, right? And this is where uh, things can go wrong because the four bytes there, the semantics has already changed. But with very complicated programs, uh, this could happen. So if we run this, if we run this program, we'll get the address. Oh, this is 64 bits. So the airplane's address is here. The airplane is flying, calling that function, number function. Then clear the new car object structure, and you can see they have the same address. Exactly the same address, 5D0, because the airplane was free. So that Deep chunk was reduced to have a car. Then we're going to send the volume of the car. So, as you can imagine, we, if we say something like this, that same layer will be used as this for the function. So, we we'll get a segment fault, right? However, if we set that as the address of secret, so here I print out that as an integer, so it's easier for us to. Uh, output and can say here. I actually print all of unsigned integer. So this one will print all of uh, uh, decimal. This one is oh no, this one is decimal. This one is uh, hex. So we just type as one four four. Same. Then we can we can call that secret function, right? So those are simple examples of those. Very complicated um, real world logs. Um, there are some other cases. So so far, those bar, they, they, the two examples I'm showing you are basically trying to overwrite things out of here, right? The structure numbers. <laughs> there could be other techniques. To overwrite those metadata, we can overwrite those pointers. We can overwrite those things to confuse the allocator, so the allocator will not know um, what the, the the real state of the heap. So those will be much more complicated, and obviously, all those uh, heap attacks um, are based on some understanding of the heap implementation, the different versions of heap implementation. They did not use this kind of structure. Okay, I think that's that's all I have actually. Okay, any questions? Yeah. You cannot guarantee that. So this is so whether you get the same address is based on the implementation of that uh, heap library of malloc, right? You cannot guarantee that. But at least the default library we are using, we will do that. Yeah. Um, many of those. If you just uh, search CVE UAF, you can get a lot, especially for brawlers. Other questions? Okay. Um, then I will summarize a little bit what we learned this semester. 
So there is a paper I will recommend everyone to read as a homework. It's called uh, It's this paper published in uh, IEEE Security and Privacy. This, this has been almost, uh, oh, this has been eight years. Okay, so this is a SOP paper, uh, systemization of knowledge. So it's basically some has some survey component of SOP paper, but uh, it provides it provides much more uh, insights uh, of it. So this paper of the homework basically summarizes all we learn and also maybe a little bit beyond um i think we covered the everything oh we didn't cover risk conditions in this class uh, this one probably talked about risk conditions as well so this one summarized all the memory vulnerabilities and also uh how to defeat those vulnerabilities uh, for example we, we talked about those most of those features as well for example control flow integrity Dynamic flow integrity, um, address based randomization. Oh, this one's really interesting. It's called instruction set randomization. Um, this one is not very practical because imagine if you have to randomize the instruction set, but your CPU has a fixed instruction set, correct? So if you randomize the instruction set, means on top of your CPU, allow the virtual machine to translate your random instruction sets to real CPU um, instruction set. And that's why this one is not very practical. Good idea, but not very practical. Then there are other data integrity, code pointer integrity. Um, I don't remember if we talked about this one. Oh, we talked about shadow stack. Uh, there's a lot of idea um, to protect stack-based buffer overflow it's called uh, safe stack. Um, the problem, I don't remember if we talked about that one. So safe stack's idea is to separate the local variables. So shadow stack, remember shadow stack, we will have two copies of written address. Why is the original one? A lot of one is the safe one. Um, the original one could be overwritten. So the idea of a safe stack or the paper they call it code pointer integrity. The idea is to separate all the local variables. Some of the local variables are safe ones. They will never be overwritten, like a, like an integer. Some of them could be overwritten like a buffer. Right? So they separate them into two stacks. Um, so the, the the one that could overwrite uh, written others will not be placed with the written address. Um, however, that idea requires a lot of uh, program analysis at a compiler layer to, to separate those things. And sometimes that cannot be uh, cannot be accurate. So this figure um, basically summarizes all the attacks and defaults. And we'll control flow hijacking. We spend a lot of time talking about control flow hijacking. And uh, there are recurrent instructions or indirect calls. Um, so this one can get added. So that's a lot of work. Yeah. So this is a this is a paper summarize everything. Then this is the first one. Then there is another one talking about how to exploit all those vulnerabilities. Oh yeah, this one. Offensive techniques in binary analysis. Uh, the first author, the, the first two authors of good friends of mine, they are right now they both at the Arizona State. So this paper, uh, three years after the first one, uh, summarizes 
uh, all the offensive techniques to automatically exploit those vulnerabilities. So this one is more like um, also those guys we have a tool for Tinder or other analysis. So in our class, we even use those tools. In our class this semester, we're using very basic tools. Just use the um, Python script because uh, I would want you to do that so you can understand exactly what's going on. Uh, but actually, we have some several guys using advanced tools. Uh, those who have been using Python tools in uh, exam. Well, that's allowed, but we didn't teach that. Okay, but they have been using that. Now, Angular is another tool to help you to do better analysis. Uh, you can develop uh, automatic tools on top of that. So this one, um, summarizes uh, all the dynamic and also static approaches to automatically exploit vulnerabilities. But to exploit vulnerabilities, first one, you need to automatically discover vulnerabilities, then generate share code or whatever automatically. So, uh, I wanted to create another class called Advanced Software Security, basically to talk about how do we automatically discover vulnerabilities or exploit vulnerabilities, but um, uh, I'm not able to create one at least for next semester. So next, I, I, I had a seminar class for that before, but I don't want to have a seminar class again on that topic because seminar class are just reading papers. So I want to make it a regular class. So the same like this one, there will be a, whole, a lot of homework, uh, a lot of hacking, you know. Uh, so I, I'm not able to create at least for next semester. Uh, so next semester, I'm offering this class again. Uh, however, for all of you, if you are interested in hacking, keep doing this. Um, what I want to do is I want to have a, a maybe weekly have hacking meetings next semester. Uh, I used to do that, but the, the, during the pandemic, I didn't do that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to play all kinds of uh, uh, online war games. Uh, the one I played before was over, over, over the wire, over the wire. So this is one of the uh, websites that make a lot of, uh, some of them are very old war games. Uh, all of them are kind of old, uh, 32 bits. Uh, so most of the system you you see here right now, everything right now is 64 bit. But the basic idea is the same, like uh, in our class, 64, 32 ideas are the same. So um, why have the hanging thing before we need to work on those? We start up from this one, the humor sentence. Uh, oh yeah, it's actually for homework you do one or two thousand loops, right? Also maze and the vortex. Um, Vortex has some uh, quite uh, good ones. Um, so we can start from here, or there's another one, uh, Yang, who probably sounds very They call it Pong, Pong College. So this one. Uh, he also he also offers a similar class. Uh, he has a, a videos, but usually his videos doesn't go um, that deep. So I go in my class. Uh, he's top of a rank uh, hacker in the world. Um, the system. This one. Okay, so this one is free for everyone to log in and play. Um, so, so this is also where we can start working on uh, in our hacking group. And the, you can see the challenges here. It has uh, share code challenges, reverse engineering challenges. Uh, memory corruptions, return-oriented programming, also keep okay, um, dynamic and okay, issues. 
um, then they have a kernel and race, which we didn't cover in this class. Um, I'm not sure what is debugging refresher. You know, they, they always try to come up with some uh, uh, good names there. Uh, I don't have all count in this website actually. Yeah, but you can see there are a lot of uh, players all over the world uh, playing on this system. So, so this is also a place uh, you guys can do things. Uh, so if we, uh, so the next sentence, so our hacking group probably will start from here. Also, uh, my lab, uh, we are developing our own platform. Uh, we got this physical server several months ago. Well, it looks like we don't have a valid uh, certificate. How do I gain? So, so come down long to go there. No, we only have we only have a TBS. <laughs> well, it's still under development. So this is a, a similar platform we are developing. Um, how do I get there? Okay. Anything I can do there? Just turn the certificates on that, so it blocks me. There's no go ahead or something. Yeah, exactly. Or let's try the province. What? I think it's the same. I don't think we have. I think uh, we were redirected to. Oh yeah. Oh, we actually have a. Okay. So this is our the system we are developing on our app. Uh, the difference between our system and the Aura L system is uh, we are. Um, embedding the solar relatives in uh, other platforms other than x86 or uh, 64. So we, uh, because in our lab, we're, our research focusing on uh, um, maybe future in risk five as well. Uh, right now it's just um. So that's why uh, we're embedding the solar relative in cortex A and cortex N. So cortex A part, very similar to what we learned in this class. The vulnerability will be almost the same because on Codex A, we still run Linux, right? On Linux, we have still have those vulnerable programs. The vulnerability are the same, but the exploit will be totally different because the exploit, most of them are instructions. So we we're talking about ARM instructions. The other thing is, we're doing so Codex A are the devices you use your, your phone, the tablet, uh, your car entertainment systems, those are Codex A. Then we also work on Codex N systems. Those are very low end IoT devices. On those devices, there is no operating system. So we, we our plan is to directly embed those vulnerabilities in the firmware. Okay. So there is no fire system, there is no Linux. It will be a totally different hacking interface. Uh, we're still working on that one. So eventually, what we have is um, um so uh also I, I actually need help uh with with this one uh right now uh the ta of this class is working a little bit on this one and also uh, several kids is in computing a little bit, but uh, uh, also my wife who is not here, so he is also helping us. 
but we will need more people to work on this one. So if you are interested in this, um, my my goal of this is not only making this like an IoT city at Pamble, but also uh, make it kind of like a Roblox. Uh, maybe you guys are too old to play Roblox. Anyone here play Roblox? A little bit? Yeah. Okay, so probably I've been playing with my son, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So my son was playing Roblox, and uh, I realized that's a very interesting idea because we can we can develop games, right? Yeah. So Roblox, you have uh, the gaming plan, you have the um, the one you play games, and also there is a game. Development IDE or something, a developer hub. So you can also develop Roblox games. Um, there are a lot of, uh, I showed my son, there are a lot of tutorials on YouTube. You can make a game in 10 minutes, something like that. Um, some simple programming, you can make a game. Then you can host your game on their platform. So then I realized one of the problems with all those existing CTF platform is. Uh, all the challenges are developed by the organizers, developed by the people who create those websites, right? Um, so um, to, to learn anything, you you also want to create challenges, not only just solve challenges. So my long-term goal of this is we also develop something like a Roblox studio to help all the players to design their own secure challenges and also host that on our website. Um, that's also a lot of work. Yeah, so that's basically what we are doing for CTF. Uh, and uh, uh, everything we learn in this class is directly related to uh, the research in our lab. Uh, for example, the right here is uh, my case here who's working on is working on some uh, uh, vulnerabilities on code exam. Right now we're working on return to user vulnerability on code exam. We discover some we believe new vulnerabilities where um, trying to prove it works on all code exam devices. Okay, so that's basically what I have. Any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, there is no the written part, just the CTF part. The written part will be take home. Yeah. yeah, so it will cover everything we discussed in this uh, in this test. Yeah, not only the second part. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, that day I, I may be a little bit late. Um, so the TA will be here first, so you can start at five. I probably will be here at like five twenty or five thirty. Yeah. Okay. I hope you enjoy this class. Uh, hopefully, I can see you guys later in other events like hanging or uh, research or whatever. Okay. See you guys. <laughs>